It's just to say, the reason I picked up uh, this psalm, Psalm 139, to teach on today, is really because it's had a big impact on me. Uh, many of you know, in July, I went away for my annual spiritual retreat, and Psalm 139 was my scripture theme of prayer and study for it. And, uh, and it really just, um, it, it touched me somewhere deep inside in terms of the way that I, I conceive and think of the way that God values me and the way that I think about God. And it's, it's begun and help, been had to be helpful and changed some things, I think, in, in me in that way. The core of the psalm might be, possibly its most famous verse 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. And here's the thing why I think it's so important and why I hope it's helpful today. And by the way, we're going to be doing some group work together, so get ready for that, all right, some discussion is that one of the constant messages from our world is that you are not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not intelligent enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not handsome enough. You don't have enough hair. You don't have enough money. You have, uh, you know, you don't have a six pack. You don't have, you don't, you're not enough. The color of your skin means you're not good enough. You're not as valuable. Some, it, that message is coming across all the time in our world, and it can batter a Christian. It can batter us. It can really dent our sense of, not self-esteem, but I think a God esteem, you know, the way that God views us. And that affects our confidence as Christians and people. And I think this psalm is a great help in that, in that area. And just a bit of context as it's read, is you'll get all this beautiful, wonderful stuff in the first uh, 20, 19 verses. And then right at the end, there's a bit which is a bit jarring, as David talks about the fact that he hates the people that hate God. And it sounds a bit jarring. But the reason is that that's what's telling us why David wrote the psalm. He was under threat, and God's honor was under threat. How did he respond to himself feeling threatened? And God's honor feeling threatened, he responded by reflecting on these qualities of God, which I think tells us something about how we respond to similar things. I believe that grasping and trusting and believing the truth in this psalm can fundamentally solve any problem in this world, even including racism. I mean, that's a bold claim. I don't think racism in this world will ever be completely resolved. But I think it can. So, this kind of thinking, the kind of way we think about each other, shown us in the psalm, can change, if you like, racial, at racist attitudes between people. I think there's something very fundamental there, but I'll explain more of that a little bit uh, later. So what we're going to do today is explore David's view of God that helps him with the challenges in his life and God's honor. And there are three sections, but we'll look at those after we've had the psalm read for us. So Sam, are you going to come up and, and read for us? Thanks very much. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will come night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. 
would all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me. You who are bloodthirsty, they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor you, those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Simon. As always, terrific reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, Psalm 139. Okay, a couple of things about this psalm. This psalm, we, we're not going to look at those last few verses about how David hates the people that hate God. That's just the context for the psalm today, all right? That's what we're going to do today. But we are going to look at the earlier three sections. The first section, verses 1 to 6, is summarized by my thinking, at least what I see in it, is that it's all about confidence in God. Verses 1 to 6 are about confidence in God because he really knows me. I mean, he really knows me. He knows me inside and out. He knows when I stand up, when I get sit down, everything. He knows everything about me. So therefore, I can have confidence in him. Second section is verses 7 to 12, which is about having confidence in God because he is always present. He's never not with us, always available. And the third section from verses 13 to 18 is about having confidence in God because he only makes wonderful things. That's the only kind of thing he makes. We can have confidence in him because he just only makes wonderful things, including you and me. But we'll come back to that in a, a little while. So that's what, where we are now. Let me see what I put in that next slide. Okay, so what I'm going to ask us to do is this. And you online can do your own thing, all right? But you're going to do the same basic thing we're doing in the room here. But um, you'll have to do it on your own. But what I'm going to ask is this. Take this out of here. So what I'm going to ask is the first section from, say, Bill up to, let's say, here. All right. Can you look at those first six verses, isn't it, the first section? All right. And ask yourself the question. So do this together with people around you. What is David celebrating about God? What is he celebrating? What are the qualities about God that he is celebrating? And then here and across, all right, there to there. All right, can you do verses 7 to 12, is it? I think that's what I said for that section. All right, and you're asking the same question. So have a discussion, make some notes, see what you think. What is David celebrating about God in verses 7 to 12? And then is it 13 to 19, 18, whatever? Yeah, so that's, that's here, all right? So look at that. I'm going to give you... Can I give you eight, nine, ten minutes? We'll see how we go, all right? And have some discussion together, make some notes, and then we'll come back and see what we've all learned. So in the first section here, in the first six verses, having confidence in God because he really knows us. So that's this group here, right? So headlines, key thoughts, key ideas, what, what came to you? What did you, what did you find? Uh, the fact that uh, no one can ever understand God. No one can ever understand God. No one, can ever, no one can ever fully understand him. Mm -hmm. Anything else? The fact that God is knowledgeable and too wonderful. He's knowledgeable? And too wonderful. And too wonderful. Okay. Good. Thank you. You got some more? Yeah. Uh, the fact that God knows everything. He knows everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Nothing is hidden. Okay. All right. It's not not short of knowledge. His Wikipedia entry is full. Uh, okay, anything else? <coughs> I had a couple, yeah, go on. His spirit is always with us. Spirit is always with us. I'm repeating this for the people online, by the way. The spirit is always with us, yep. And the protector, hemming us in. Protector, hemming us in, yep. 
Father. Heavenly Father. Our, of our Father. Yeah. Heavenly Father. Anything else you want to add? He's all understanding of our circumstances. He's understanding of our circumstances. Okay, he understands when sometimes your friends don't fully understand, but God does. Mm. Mm. Gives us freedom despite knowing what we're about to say or do. He uses freedom despite the fact he already knows what we're going to say or do, and some of it may not be um, the best. <laughs> we still have that freedom. Okay, that's quite uh, quite something, isn't it? Stephanie, did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, what are you butting in for? Yeah. We've said, we've said that we can, we not really fully understand God. Just I listened to a podcast this week, which really struck me, and I, I respect it. It's a science podcast, and it was about cosmology and the universe and everything. And, um, they were asking this one scientist about God, and what he thinks about God, because he's an atheist. And then he said, well, we don't even understand the universe. We don't have to understand, understand molecules and how everything is fit, fitting together. And we don't, understand dark matter and everything. Mm -hmm. So how can we permit, say anything about it? this concept called God? Mm -hmm. We don't even physical things. So mm -hmm. I can't answer that question. <laughs> even though I don't believe in God, he's saying I can't answer that question. That's interesting, isn't it? Understand things. Yeah, well that's it. I think the only way we can understand God is, is by how much he reveals of himself to us. Mm -hmm. That's basically it, isn't it? These are really helpful, helpful thoughts. Thank you very much. I'm going to add a couple of things. Um, and then go on to the next group back there. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, he knows us better than we know ourselves. All right? We think we know ourselves. We don't really. We know bits. Right? When you get married, it often happens that you get to know things about yourself that you didn't realize were there because your wife or spouse knows, notices those things. Right? But going through life, we understand more and more about ourselves, but we never fully understand ourselves quite in the way that God does. I went to the dentist this week. I might be having some dental work done. And uh, instead of the normal x-ray, they put me in a CAT scan. So they did a CAT scan of my head. And then they showed it to me on a screen afterwards. It looks horrible. I mean, the teeth and everything looks horrible. But I thought, well, that's interesting. There are parts of me that that CAT scan is seeing that I can't see. I can't see bits inside my jaw and stuff, right? God sees it all. And despite the fact he sees all of it, including the um, decaying bits, <laughs> he still loves us. Right? Okay. Um, the very hairs of your head are all numbered, Matthew 10, 30. And verse 3, yeah, you, you discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways, the good ones and the bad ones. I think 1 John 3, 20 can be helpful. Whenever our heart condemns us, it's God is greater than our heart and knows all things. He, he's able to put it all in perspective. The hemming in and the hand, that's God's protective hand, right? You remember Moses, uh, when God appeared to him, God put his hand there to prevent Moses from being sort of blown away. It, this is a protective uh, thing going on right here. Okay, verses 7 to 12. Confidence in God because he's always present. Uh, we'll do this group first and then that group. So this side, what did you discover? Anybody want to share something? It doesn't matter who you hide from or what you hide from, God's there. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter what you're hiding from, God is there. You can hide from people, but you can't hide from God. You can hide from people, but not from God. True. Okay, yeah. I think something interesting that Brahman said, going back to the original meaning of the word hold from, hold fast, is that actually a nautical word? And in the Dutch means it's like um, uh, God holding on to you. Mm -hmm. And that whole sense of, you know, it's not actually us holding on to God, it's God holding on to us. God's holding on to us. And holding it together. I think that is actually quite a few. God's holding it together. God's holding us together. Yeah. Yes, as we threaten to discombobulate. But somehow God's holding us together. Thank you. Anybody else in that group? Yeah. Is it it's obviously about us running away from God, hiding in the darkness. Yeah. And as we possibly use looking at different versions, okay, so Chinese, you know, the darkness can also be haunted. Haunted. Mm. It's the idea of the night of what 
we're, you know, shameful about maybe, whether it be the fears or the external things that we're afraid of, whether it's inside ourselves, God is there guiding us. Mm. No matter what's going on inside, God is there. He's with us, in it. What about this side as well? Any thoughts on over here? Yeah, Sam? I'm saying that in everything that sums up kind of that from that. You know, the show of God, like, and you basically celebrate how the only part of this is is based on what he said about, you know, that for example, he says, and where can I go from the spirit, where can I flee from the presence of the highly stuff, you know, the matter of where we go, where we're seeing the darkness of light, so there's that scene here. Yeah. 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 Good, thank you. Anybody else in that group? Um, Carlos, go for it. Oh, I'm, I'm just thinking that um, I don't know if it's just sat, he's putting his money in consult with the time being as his life is threatened. When he's expressing his distress, so he's looking at us that God can provide safety. God provides safety. Because he's everywhere. In these things. Yeah, I think he's, he knows that God, he's protected not to push like God. He's protected. He's terrified. Yeah. Um, yeah. He does know that God is there. I don't know that, yeah. No, that's right. I mean, David had um, a number of experiences in his life, through his long life, of being chased of being in danger, of having to run away, of having to hide. So he would have had a, a good understanding of what it means to be somebody who needs to know that God is with him even when he is hiding or when he is in danger. Mm, very good point. Good stuff. Should we move? Oh, Carlos. Um, Peter Charles was saying about the way in which he was a musician, so he's expressing the way that Barry was saying he's more logical. He was logically, but you know, this is a special note that gives, well, I suppose, ways that some people really need to understand. It's, um, you know, some people, some people can get that from the Bible, but there's some people that also, in the end, discuss the matter of the value that it's kind of the next product, I think, that we're talking about the process of the Bible. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Even last will not be far to you. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of being kind of put around here. Mm -hmm. So God seems to start this within us, I suppose, in a similar sense. He seems to start this within us, but to see the good of that is what? He starts it maybe, he sees the good. He sees the good. He sees the good even in the darkness. Well, because it's not dark to him, yeah. right? He can see the purpose in things that look obscure to us. Okay, let's move on to the third group because we're running out of time a little bit. So, hello, third group. What did you find? These were our findings. Excellent. Um, kept, kept saying, um, yes, God watches over us. Twenty-seven and twenty-eight. Um, Jesus is with us. Um, Jesus is with us. 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 And on the other way is that he cares for us. He looks over to the other seat and he takes care of us. Um, we, talked, we focused on the word frame, an outline, a design. That in a sense, God knew what he wanted to create even before he created it. That God hmm. knew already what he wanted to do with each and every one of us. That he'd thought, so he'd given thought to his, what he wanted to do, what he wanted to make from us, of us. How we did that was via knitting. Having done some knitting once upon a time, we picked it up a long time ago. It is a skill that is done meticulously and is woven together. God weaves us together. It takes time to do, it takes thought, it takes accuracy, it takes precision. Um, God covers his love for us from that very moment of conception all the way to our last breath. It is one which is consistent, it is one that is with us through all of our lives. God knows how to help us because he knows us in and out. Sometimes that help might be somewhat obscured 
Well, you think, why is God doing this to me? Why am I being disciplined? Well, in the end, it leads up, it brings righteousness, because God knows what we need, not necessarily what we want. And we also looked at how David celebrated God knowing so much of us that he leads us into situations and he leads us through situations. And because of that, we grow and mature in our own Christian life and our faith a little bit. Super. Thanks, Lance. Can you tell that he used to be a teacher? <laughs> No, very, very high. And I know that comes from the whole group. So thank you very much, uh, all of you there. Let me make a couple of comments and then show you something and then ask you to do something in, in, in just a minute. Um, I think one of the things that we see here is that, as it was alluded to by somebody, one can look at some of these promises as almost a threat, or you can look at them as a wonderful promise. God sees what's happening in the dark. <laughs> he sees me and my, my sin and my darkness. I th really think that's not the, the emphasis of this psalm. Now, it is true that God does see all of our sin, but this is a psalm of confidence in God. It's a, it's a psalm of this threat. How do I respond to the threat? The way we respond to a threat is not, oh dear, God sees all I do in the dark. Well, the way we respond to the threat is, God knows what's going on and I can't, I can't see it. I can't tell. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know how this is going to end, but God sees God knows, God understands, and God cares about, about me. So I think that's the emphasis, because I've, I have, maybe I've done it myself, but I have heard parts of this psalm taught in a very negative way. You better watch out, God sees what's going on in the dark. Well, he does, and there are other passages about that, I think, but this is much more about have confidence in him. How would, how would that other teaching have been helpful to David when he's under threat, right? So this is the context, at least, of this psalm is that kind of idea. The, uh, the thought of going to the heavens, into the depths, the wings of the dawn, settling on the far side of the sea. This is east to west, right? From the furthest east to the furthest west. The, um, the wings of the dawn. There's a, there's a, a way of uh, interpreting and perhaps translating this to mean that basically as soon as the light begins to gleam, God is... God has moved faster than the light moves to get to where the light is going. In other words, he travels faster than light. That's not technically, scientifically, I think, what the psalmist was thinking, but it's that idea that he's there before we get there. He goes before us where we're going. He gets there before us. He's already there waiting for us. He goes faster even than light travels. It's that kind of idea, if you see what I mean. Um... The right hand, the hand of God is strong, it's authoritative, it's kingly, it is, it is predictably benevolent. God is always with us. We don't have to fear the dark. Okay, and then the inward parts. He made our inmost being. Um, that's the kidneys. Uh, that's what the Hebrews, <laughs> when, this, when they were talking about the inner person, they were talking about the kidneys. That's, uh, he even knows your kidneys. It's, it's the literal thing, what he's saying. But the point is more, he really knows us, every part of us inside uh, and out. Um, so you, we're a wonder. You know, I posted on Facebook, is it on here? Yeah, uh, bats flying in my garden this week. I've turned the volume down on here, but there they are. Can you just see these little bats? I'm sitting in the garden two nights ago, I think it was. Uh, there's these bats are just flying around. And you, you sometimes you just sit there, and maybe bats aren't your thing, but <laughs> bat Penny is a registered bat handler, by the way. Uh, she's got training in bat handling. But um, you, sometimes you see things that God does, and they make you go, wow. When I see bats flying, you know, they're kind of blind, they're using a sonic way of figuring it. I just think that's just a... God, God, God didn't have to do that like that. I mean, there's something astonishing about that kind of thing. And if you will indulge me just for a moment, uh, proud granddad moment here. Um, again, I'm take, taking the audio off here, but, you, but there's something about little children that help us to realize how wonderful life is. And we get a bit old and crusty, you know, we get a bit cynical, life happens, we get a bit wrinkled, I don't know, you get arthritis in your thumb, which I have, um, and things like that. But there's something about a child that reminds you of the wonder of the human form. 
So uh, little, she's trying to learn how to use a spoon here. My daughter Lydia is doing her best to help her to not use her hand straight into her mouth. And there's a moment coming up which you will all like, I think, as we, she's trying, uh, use the spoon to lay her. Try the spoon. Yeah, well, well done, you're doing really well. She's learning. It's amazing now. Here we go. Let's try again. Uh, grab the spoon. Wait for it. Wait for it. And... <laughs> Flicked it in her hair on the wall behind, all over the place. Um, you know, there's something about young children. When I was very young, um, I had a, a whole load of great aunts. Uh, my, my grandmother's sisters had loads of sisters. And one of their favorite phrases about a small child, they see a small child. I don't know if any of you will remember or have heard this too from your background. They see a small child and a small child would do something a little bit cheeky or funny. And they say, oh, she's a caution. She's a caution they'd say and I don't really quite know what they meant uh, but it's just a thing they'd say she's a caution um, and I say, but what struck me from this song is what would God say of all of us he'd say she's a wonder he's a wonder wonder your works are wonderful you are wonderful you are. You are. You are a wonder. God made you. God only makes wonderful things. You're a wonder. Wonder if you. I wonder if you really believe it or feel it. You're a wonder. This is why this kind of thing could be a cure for all kinds of hatred and racism. Because if we all saw each other as God's wonder, there wouldn't be a division, right? There'd be no division. Because I'm a wonder, you're a wonder, we're all wonders, so let's celebrate that. That's what the kingdom of God is. That's what the Christian church is meant to be and can be. At its finest, it can be. You are a wonder. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something embarrassing. I'm warning you. All right, and you don't have to do it, but I am going to ask you to say out loud, I am a wonder. I am a wonder. Okay. <laughs> Should we do it together? One, two, three. I, I am a wonder. wonder. How does that feel? Yeah? I knew already. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but how, 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 so, but seriously, how much of a fraudulent thing does that feel to say? And how much of an authentic thing does it feel to say? I am a wonder. Saying it on your own in the, uh, in the park is one thing. Saying it around other people is a bit different. You're a wonder. Are you flawed? Uh huh. Are you a bit dented and broken in places? Yeah. I, do you have sin in you? Well, you you do sin, but you're still. A mm -hmm. Thank you, Pete. Still a wonder. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing, and then we're going to wrap up and take communion. I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody else and tell them, "You are a wonder." Can we do that? Well, well, and how does that feel? You see, you are a wonder. I am a wonder. You are a wonder. God is wonderful. God is wonderful. He only makes wonders. You are a wonder. We are wonders. And isn't that wonderful?
Psalm 139. There's a lot more one could dig out of that. But we're going to take bread and wine, and while we do, we're going to sing the song, Wonderful Grace, because that's why we can come to God.